All right. Sorry. Thank you. We're back. It's uh, 10 after noon. Um, just as a time check, we we have a lot to juggle. I, I'm I'm glad to hear that before I before I got here, um, there was an explanation of the purpose of the workshop. It is incredibly valuable, not just for us, but as I said, I think as a community coming together to be able to hear from everybody. So the whole day is important uh, because the public comments are just as important as the folks who've asked uh, to present on panels. We have a lot of panels. We have a lot of people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, information to share, and it's just very important for all of us to be able to ask the questions that we need to ask in anticipation of our giving uh, feedback and direction uh, after this meeting. And um, so I hope that other people are trying to listen and suspend whatever their preconceptions are and really listen to the challenge uh, before us, because the, the risks and the consequences are terrible uh, all around, just as we thought they would be. I just hope they wouldn't be this terrible this um, soon this year. So uh, we, we do have to grapple with that. Um, I know we're juggling time. I have a number of people that have to leave also by three. Um, I know there are some people who probably won't arrive until uh, one. So we'll just uh, please bear with us as we uh, juggle the individual speakers with some of the panels that are coming up. And um, thank you. We're moving back to the fisheries panels next and sliding into that. But Ron, I wanted to give you a chance to continue for a little while. I appreciate that you'll be with us um, all day as we um, go through this and your your thoughts and experience are always very helpful to us. Well, I'm happy to have Carl uh, Wilcox from State Fish and Wildlife and, uh, and Larry from Fish and Wildlife Service here um, that will I might throw it to you guys in a couple of my slides. We're going to talk about um, the compliance point question and um, all the, you know, how that maybe lines up with some of the um, the monitoring from a fishery standpoint, Carl. So maybe, yeah, I'm sorry. It's hard when you're to trying Carl. to be polite and talk to a person and the microphone's facing you the other way. But. I might throw it to to these guys, um, and if uh, Garwin returns, uh, for and he will, questions. he's on his way back. That's okay. otherwise, I would just start with them so that we wouldn't okay. run out of uh, time. But uh, go go ahead, and then at some point, I may just suggest that we transition to the the fish agencies because I would sure. like to try and get through their panel before one. Very good. So um, I, I think we looked at this picture before. This is just to, to refresh our memory as to what the temperature control device at Shasta looks like. Um, and this is uh, back a few years ago. Uh, but at least this is kind of illustrating at least the upper row shutters at the device. Um, but we anticipate being lower to, than this. I, I wanted to share this. This is something that I think we will be um, making available. This is a dashboard uh, that uh, some of my staff have put together to try to help um, when we talk generically about the shutter management um, at Shasta and what's kind of going on. So this is a really busy uh, graphic, uh, but kind of over to the left, there's uh, these yellow rectangles that represent the uh, various gates in this temperature control device. And then uh, just to kind of show which gates are open. Um, and at this particular time, what's referred to as the pressure relief gates or the, what is also kind of known as the, the lower gates, and then there's the side gates are, are kind of below that. Currently, we've got one of those gates open, um, which is uh, the product of just trying to meet the temperatures downstream in the warmer weather we started having uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, now, the fact that we've got one gate open at this point um, is not a bad thing. Uh, actually, it's kind of ahead of where we thought we might be at this particular time. Um, but this is a bit of a beta version. It still needs to be trued up because some of the reporting of temperatures and flows are actually instantaneous. And it would be a lot nicer if it was kind of average for a day. So don't uh, pay too much attention to that. But I think that this is something that we'll want to make available to folks. And the interesting part of this graph is that uh, we've tried to take the, the temperature profiles that we've been talking about um, 
and kind of show where those temperatures line up with some of these gate configurations. And what's interesting about this is I'll kind of jump to this next one where we take a snapshot in time of an estimate of this time last year. Um, and at first glance, you might say there's not a lot different here. But if you look at those middle gates and the temperature of the water just from a color coding standpoint, we had much warmer water at the middle gate level uh, and an overall uh, lower lake level at this particular time. But we had three of the lower, lower gates open to be able to blend the temperature of the water. So this situation right now is, you know, we're, is part of the stretching out of um, the cold water pool partly through a lower release and partly through a little higher temperature that we're trying to meet downstream. So this is something I think might be useful for uh, at least the group that will be really monitoring closely the temperature management and looking at the, the water through the device and through Keswick and then downstream uh, so that we're making decisions about things that are very key about stretching the cold water pool that will probably have a multi-agency, multidisciplinary, you know, fairly small group that's uh, fairly well empowered to make some decisions about is it, you know, what's the right balancing of letting the, and look at the forecast of temperatures, let the temperature go up a little bit before you make a very significant uh, change and start tapping into some colder water. The other part about this, which is indicative of our earlier discussion is, yeah, although we're down to the lower level of the gates. Uh, even last year, we were tapping into, although it was colder than maybe this year, uh, it is, uh, you had to have three gates open to blend that warmer water coming from above. So we were chewing through this colder water at this particular time, going into late June through July at a pretty fast rate to meet a 56 degree compliance point. So this is just kind of uh, a little bit of a future, future to come element that I think uh, rather than talking conceptually about gates and what does that mean, this is at least to try to give some transitions to how that will work. I thought that was a great uh, communication tool, the, the dashboard, in terms of the complexity of the, the temperature and the interaction with the gates. So was, I commend staff not, on not this. Not to dwell on this, I mean, if we get this thing working, just to kind of explain the temperature, what comes past the dam and through Keswick, how we blend that with temperatures through Spring Creek, out of Whiskey Town, and then the key uh, gauge locations that we're looking downstream, I think will be um, a, a useful snapshot and then can lead to at least we get into more form sets of discussion. Uh, if, I may, just, if I may just interrupt, if we, we have Garwin Yip is here now for a limited time, so I don't know if it's too much switching around, but uh, if we want to maximize his time, if it's a, is it okay time to switch over. Fine with me if you guys. Is that all right? The go. rest of you. I know it's jumping back and forth, but I do want to make sure that we hear from the fish panel, fish agency panel. Sorry, Carl. Are you leading off? Uh, yes. Uh, Carl Wilcox, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so you know. I just wanted to, with this slide, orient people to where temperature compliance points are. Uh, we talk about Clear Creek compliance point. Well, it's not really Clear Creek. It's uh, three miles upstream of Clear Creek. Uh, and we're really managing salmon within a, for the most part, within a uh, six mile reach, which is the Highway 40 four bridge, uh, which is, you know, four miles upstream from Clear Creek. Uh, that's where most of the action is. We're trying to maintain conditions there and we're doing it by managing to the Clear Creek or the Bonnie View Bridge uh, compliance point. Uh, we have, there are now gauges at, in CDEC at those locations. So you can track what temperatures are looking like at those locations. Uh, we track them all the time, uh, and I'll show you an example of, of that. You know, I wanted to make the point that, uh, you know, from Les's, you know, the temperature compliance requirements 
in some years are all the way down to Red Bluff, which are many, many, many miles downstream. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have never managed below uh, Clear Creek just because of conditions and the ability to maintain cold water in those reaches. Uh, and I just want to point out that, you know, this is an incredibly difficult situation. Nobody is winning anything here. We're just hanging on. Uh, every decision is hard. Uh, since we, it came to light that we didn't have the cold water, we have met almost continuously uh, in technical sessions, in management sections, in director sections to try to figure out something to be able to do which can balance the competing needs. Uh, and, you know, there have been relaxations at, from all perspectives, and one of the key ones is the relaxation of the 57 degree target not to exceed 58 at Clear Creek. Uh, as Gary Bobker pointed out, 56 is kind of the upper limit of the requirements of salmonids and once you get above that then you start having effects and in previous presentations there's been a graph that basically illustrated what the consequences of having temperatures above those levels during the egg incubation period and the uh, alevine and early juvenile life stages are and once you get over 60 degrees you lose most of the fish. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to avoid with the wild population. You know, at the same time, we have taken and are taking fish into uh, Livingston Stone Hatchery, the same as we did last year, which is the maximum capacity to raise those out for release as a hedge against uh, what we experienced last year, which was a near complete failure of that the wild spawning uh, year class. Have you... Uh, have you modeled um, with this new, um, uh, well, this framework, I guess, it's not an actual plan yet, but within the framework, um, have you modeled what the expected mortality is? And uh, first question, second question, I know last year we were at 95 percent. What is um, expected for mortality in, say, a successful year? Uh I'm going to look to Garwin because he's probably more f familiar with it. But in a normal year, I think we're looking at about 26% as the average from for the last 14 years. Uh, so I think you know what modeling has been done today in the biological assessment that is forthcoming. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, uh, is looking at we might be able to accomplish something in the 15% range, uh, but I'll let Garwin speak to that. So those mentioned of 95%, that's mortality. 27% is about what I was thinking. Um, based on the literature, and that's survival. Um, and I'm not familiar with the current modeling effort uh, as it pertains to uh, speculating on what a successful, and quote, successful year is or if we lose temperature control. Um, Kramer Fish Sciences um, did develop a model for egg and fry survival. Um, so we, we utilized that as one of the tools. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember what the numbers were, um, but plugging, plugging in um, a, a base release of 7250 for June, July, and August and associated temperatures, I think the model indicates about 90% survival to hatching something in that range. Um, hatching doesn't mean survival because the, the alvin need to incubate and then actually emerge out of the reds. And yeah, then the another question that later, I, not. What's that? Another question that, um, that we've been asking ourselves and our uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center has been helping out with this additional modeling is how much habitat <clears throat> will the fry have after they emerge? Where are they gonna go? Um, are they going to emerge because temperatures are, in quote, suitable, and then do they die? So they've been helping us out with that kind of modeling to see how much habitat we have at the back end of uh, the summer. So just uh, going 
on we're uh, monitoring continuously uh, in the river to assess spawning timing and location and one of the indications that we use are our carcass counts and this basically shows where we see carcasses uh, the thing to keep in mind here is that carcasses represent you know kind of the level of spawning and the intensity not necessarily the location because the carcasses tend to float downstream yeah so just can you just explain that for people who aren't fish okay so these are the, the spawn the carcasses out, uh, normally to a regular person carcasses bat Right. Well, in so this case, to, you, this is how you count salmon that have spawned because they die after spawning. Yeah, correct. So, just if you could just explain that in yes. three okay. sentences so for the a, folks listening. Carcass counts are done with salmon because they die when they spawn, and so that's an indication that spawning has occurred, and it's an indication to, of the amount of spawning by the number of carcasses and where it's occurring by the number of carcasses with the caveat that carcasses tend to float downstream. So we find them farther downstream than the actual spawning occurs. So when you look at this table, uh, most of the carcasses are found uh, above the Highway 44 bridge, uh, what, 75% or so, and the remaining 25% are found downstream. Uh, and then, you know, what we're seeing this year is that, you know, the number of carcasses is going up. So we may be seeing a little bit earlier uh, spawning timing than we've seen in the last couple of years, which, depending on whether it's actually happening or not, uh, may allow us some flexibility later in the season. What we've seen in the last couple of years has been spawning later which requires maintaining cold water temperatures and farther into the uh, into the fall to make sure that the eggs and larvae survive. Uh, so there may be some flexibility depending on run timing and spawning timing. If uh, that's correct, when would you expect to see that window um, open up? Well, it could be in September as opposed to early October or mid-October like we've seen the last two years. Uh, but, you know, that remains to be seen and we'll be tracking that on a continuous basis. Uh, the other thing that's monitored is red distribution. Uh, and as you can see to date, most of the reds have been found uh, above the Highway 44 bridge. Uh, one has been found just below the Highway 44 bridge on the uh, Painter's Riffle restoration site. Uh, so, you know, restoration provides habitat, so at least we have an indication that they use the habitat. But most of the fish are above that as they have been in the past year or two. Uh, and that relates to probably where the most suitable conditions are. Uh, the surveys are conducted by boat, uh, aerial surveys and to some degree snorkeling surveys uh, to get the deeper ones. Uh, and then we're tracking uh, water temperatures. Uh, and so I think this chart was shown earlier. Uh, so we're looking at you know what's coming out of Shasta, what's coming out of Keswick, and what we're seeing at the compliance point and at the Highway 44 bridge. And you can see the, the differences there, uh, you know. And we're also putting in uh, the effects of the Spring Creek uh, releases into the uh, water body above Ke Keswick, uh, which affect uh, releases, you know, out of Keswick, whether they're cooler or warmer may have a, a, a a mitigating effect or a, a warming effect. Uh, you can see that there's fairly substantial uh, warming within the uh, reservoir behind Keswick uh, before it leaves Keswick and heads downstream. Uh, so that's always a, a management concern and Ron can certainly speak to that. Uh, and these 
hot conditions only exacerbate that problem. It's also plays into how much water you need to release to be able to get water through Keswick that's, uh, that's cooler. Right. Uh, and then now, you can, now, can I just just again for folks listening and maybe for me too as well, when you see the temperature spiking and then at around June seventeenth you see the drop. So that, is that because of a difference in release was, of cool water or a change in temperature outside? That was an operational change to release cooler water. Uh, and this is going to be going on all summer. Uh, on a real-time basis uh, to try to to maintain those temperatures and keep uh, temperatures at Clear Creek or Bonny View at or below, ideally below and closer to 57 degrees. And then this is just to give you a sense, you know, of what the next week is going to bring us. Uh, this is just the average ambient air temperatures versus what we're going to see this week. Uh, the proverbial heat storm is coming, uh, and so that's going to certainly influence how we operate and whether or not we'll be looking to release more water in advance, cooler water, not more water necessarily, but more cooler water to keep things within the uh, desired range. Uh, we've seen these kinds of conditions for the last three months, not as extreme, but basically Redding temperatures have been running well above normal, uh, as they have within the state. Uh, so this is a key component and was a key component of you know trying to anticipate the worst temperature conditions in the modeling that we've done for the current plan uh, that weren't re necessarily reflected as well in the previous plan. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Garwin to talk about the RAF temperature model runs. Yeah, so earlier I just saw so Garwin, you up with no fisheries. Um, earlier I mentioned our Southwest Fisheries Science Center helping us, helping us out with some modeling. Um, this is, these are outputs of the raft temperature model. Uh, raft is river assessment forecast temperature. So we take the outputs from reclamation, the, the water temperatures associated with their temperature model run and plug it into this model that the Science Center developed. So these uh, different colors, unfortunately, it's pretty rainbow color, unfortunately being that there's less blue, but blue is colder, cooler, um, red is warmer. So these model run results show Temperatures at different locations at 7,000, 7,250, um, 7,500 releases uh, in, in June, July, and August, and also in comparison with uh, the release schedule and temperatures in 2014 down at the bottom. So going to 2014, um, we all know, and I think we know, um, that we lost control of uh, water temperatures last year. The dark line that you see is the 57 degree line at, at around River, well, not River Mile. Um, these are miles downstream of Keswick, so around 10 or 11 miles, that's, that's the approximate location of the Clear Creek temperature compliance point. So upstream of there is where most of the spawning um, was concentrated in 2014. So as you walk through from the left to the right, June, July, August, and uh, just going into September, there was enough habitat defined as water quality um, for relatively suitable egg and fry incubation. Uh, once they emerged going into September and October, um, that's when temperatures fell apart. If you look at the top graph, there, was a, there were graphs here that identified the exact location and timing of spawning of reds. Um, but that kind of confused matters because we're talking about data from 2014 and how it could be applied in 2015. So the science center, based on our request, um, established these uh, box plots, I guess, on the top. So uh, maybe in the beginning half of August, you see that line on the top. That's um, like the peak of spawning and, and incubation. And then um, you have the dotted lines before and after these 
uh, boxes that indicate the earlier and the later spawning. And then same with the next line, the 45 days post-emergence, that might be when the fry are hanging out upstream, uh, uppermost parts of the Sacramento River. Um, so you have that window starting at maybe the middle of August and going out to end of November. So those are the two um, life stage life stages, uh, lumping in eggs and fry in the gravel where they have no control over anything. And then you have the fry that could swim upstream or downstream into cooler water. Um, so going down to these graphs, the 7,000, 7,250, and 7,500 Keswick releases, you see where the, 50, the 57 degree isotherm line is in each of these graphs. And if you can picture line going across the 10 in the middle graph, the 7250, that's where the habitat would be around Clear Creek. Um, if you're a fish, it would really matter um, to the naked eye. Just looking at these, they look relatively similar. But if I highlight, let's say in August, at 7,000 release, the 57 degree line is considerably higher upstream in that graph then say at the 7500 where that 57 degree line is lower so that would provide more habitat for more reds farther downstream so that's how we're using these graphs and then going into 45 days post emergence september october november if we have successful fry emergence how much habitat will the fry have when now they're free swimming so that's how we're using these uh graphs and in, in different scenarios that reclamation was using as far as Keswick releases and temperatures. Uh, one of the interests that we have, especially with the Hindcast report that came out last year, was we wanted to delay the full, full site get access into October. So playing around with Keswick releases in addition to temperatures and uh, opening side gates, how far can we stretch that water? Uh, we start with, and Carl mentioned, 56. We want 56 throughout the season, um, and after the new uh, reservoir temperatures came out, that's an impossible scenario. 56, uh, you know, dream on. So can we meet 57? Uh, if the answer is yes, then how and for how long? And if the answer is no, then 58. You know, we just continue with so many different iterations of the model runs and also the location. We talked about Clear Creek and when we, um, when we analyzed the effects of the, of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project in 2009, Clear Creek was what we considered the farthest upstream temperature compliance point. And now we're talking you know, another five miles upstream of that, given the current situation. So for the fish, we had to do what we had to do uh, to balance the difference between successful spawning at 56 and then having temperatures go up to uh, ultimate mortality or higher mortality throughout the season, but at least we're spreading the risk throughout the season for fish anyway. The idea is to spread the risk so you have more survival than toasting them all at the end. That's right. Is that what you're saying? That's that's what we're trying to do. Oh, sorry, not yeah. I, what? So some of the um, so at the last board workshop, we heard from board staff that um, the board members were asking for a little buffer. We're riding right at the 56 line, and that, that discussion kind of fell apart at the next meeting. Um, it's not riding the 56, it's somewhere higher than that. Um, so we ended up discussing things like, well, now we have the reservoir profile of temperatures. So what's the chance that since we're wrong then, that we're going to be wrong next week or next month? Are we going to be here? We might as well set up shop in Reclamation's office, and you know we're going to be meeting every day. Um, so we have a temperature management plan that comes out in March and then another one in April, May, June and throughout the rest of the year. Um, so we tried to add some buffers. We tried to project out the, the three month outlook temperature forecast at a 10% more uh, warmer forecast instead of the 50%, which is, you know, go either way, warmer or cooler. Um, and likewise with temperatures and planning the operations could go either way. We either in your words, toast the fish later in the season or end up with more water. So we decided to use the 10% exceedance or 10% um, three month outlook for warmer temperatures. And these are air temperatures in Reading. And as it turns out, we're, we're kind of marching towards that. Um, on average, I don't like using Celsius, but that's what I know right now, 3.71 
degrees Celsius on average, warmer over the last three months. I think that translates to somewhere uh, higher than six degrees. And we're seeing that this week. Um, some other things, I don't remember if it was uh, Carl or Ron mentioned that our Southwest Fisheries Science Center over the next month will be deploying um, temperature probes right at the face of Shasta Dam um, to get better idea of real-time temperatures across a profile. Um, what I just heard this morning is that um, they're going to go out over the next month to assess uh, and get the kinks out of um, actually deploying the probes and then it'll be functional at the beginning of August. So we'll, st we'll still util utilize um, reclamations probes and tools uh, every two weeks, but we'll, we'll supposedly have real-time information throughout the reservoir. Uh, we're using raft model. Another thing that we've agreed to do is target uh, Clear Creek as a temperature compliance point. Um, as Carl mentioned, we do have now um, a new CDAC gauge um, to evaluate real-time temperatures at the Highway 44 bridge, but it hasn't been calibrated, so the fish, fish agencies agreed that we would utilize the data coming out of that monitoring station, but not switch the temperature compliance point to that location. So when we're talking about targeting 57 and not to exceed 58 at Clear Creek, that adds just a little buffer, and that buffer is about uh, 0.5 degrees to where we think the downstream location of the Reds are right now. Fahrenheit or Celsius? 0.5 degrees. Fahrenheit. So a couple of other considerations as we're working towards developing a temperature management plan uh, and operations management plan. One was to establish a base flow and also base temperature that, in quotes, we could all live with. Not, not shoot high and go down from there, not shoot low and keep increasing. Uh, we talk about stability. We have you know, stability in farming. We have stability or expectations as far as the biology as we understand it for winter runs. So that's, that was our goal. So we ended up with the 57 Fahrenheit at Clear Creek, uh, the 7250 right now for June, July, and August with real-time flexibility to go up or down. And as far as I understand with uh, the key components of the Shasta temperature management plan right now anyway, we didn't establish sideboards. We didn't say no greater than 250 up or down or 500 or anything like that because it depended on real time uh, location and timing and duration of the winter run. One of our goals I think I mentioned earlier was to uh, try to delay the access to full side gates. So I think the current plan delays that until um, at least October. And also to stabilize flows. Uh, each year we see um, Keswick releases um, upwards of 10,000 or more during the summer. And when runs spawn, wherever the flows are. So if they spawn during the higher flows on the edges, then we risk dewatering those reds as the eggs and alevin are incubating. So that was one of the considerations that we had is either to stabilize those flows or to not ramp down too much too fast as um, when run is still incubating. So there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion and consideration into uh, where we landed here. That that actually sounds like some of the things that some of the irrigation stakeholders had asked for earlier in the year that the stabilizing it and having them spawn where you're more likely to be able to maintain the flow is better than these wild ranges. Right. And on the back end of summer and beginning of fall, then we have fall run coming up. So. How fast can we decrease those releases and not do waterfall run rates? So aside from this graph and these notes that I just mentioned, I think uh, I think that's it for me. Unless you have any questions. I have a question about um, habitat. So um, I think you mentioned painter's riffle and um, some evidence of spawning in that area. That was a project that was implemented by the settlement contractors, right. I think, last year. And, you know, we have seen a, a fish spawn Response. there this year. Right. So that's a good thing. Um, are there other um, projects in the works? Uh, not specific ones. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about things that can be done. Uh, and I think... Uh, 
that are desirable post kind of drought conditions in that, you know, there's suitable habitat in which to place restoration is pretty limited right now. Uh, but there are actions underway, like the you know desire to put in the uh, Knights Landing outfall gate fish barrier uh, that will not really address issues this year, but will potentially address stranding issues by next year. So there's a lot of effort going into that, as well as other actions within the uh, the Yolo bypass to at least rescue adult fish that get into the bypass. Uh, due to false attraction flows, uh, we saw you know large numbers of fall run in particular coming into uh, the bypass this year uh, because flows in the river were low and there were fairly substantial flows coming out of the Calusa Basin uh, during the fall. Uh, so, you know, taking actions to to minimize the effects of stranding associated with other things that are going on in the system and may be exacerbated by the flow uh, are in the works. Uh, but uh, And there's a long list of other actions that have been identified by various groups, the Golden Gate Salmon Association and the Northern California Water Agencies that uh, we're looking at ways to address those as well. So um, I have a question regarding the um, real-time monitoring. Uh, for presence of um, reds or whatever the life cycle um, that you're looking to manage for, and then also the um, uh, real-time uh, uh, temperature uh, device or devices that you have, could you talk a little bit about, you know, in the um, in, in the interest of uh, balancing? So right now you have 7250, and your uh, temperature forecast is a conservative forecast. If you see that uh, the temperatures, the ambient temperatures um, drop and there is a, um, a, an associated uh, drop in temperature uh, as far as you know, the, what level you're taking it out of the reservoir, at what point would you be able to respond with an adaptive management? Uh, so just to give an idea, so many days or uh, at, at some other marker that would um, make the fish, fish agencies have confidence in the ability to utilize an adaptive uh, management uh, sort of a change to the system. Well, I, part of it, part of that answer should be to the, to Ron, uh, but, you know, I think we can, are set up currently to respond in a, pretty rapid uh, way. Uh, it depends on where we are with water temperatures and releases and the management of the cold water pool. So it, you know, I think, you know, we have talked about scenarios where ambient conditions were lower uh, and we could conserve cold water by releasing slightly warmer water. Uh, out of the reservoir. The question then is, is there water to uh, release over and above the 7250? And I, you know, I think that will be based on kind of real-time situations relative to what's happening in the river and in the, in the atmosphere. And, you know, based on uh, the forecasts that we get from the Weather Service uh, to guide us in making those decisions. But no guarantees. Right. Understood. You can probably just add to what Carl was saying. I, I think what's envisioned as it relates to maybe making adjustment to this base number is that uh, an, it would probably be an accumulation of events over, let's say, a course of a month. So let's say a month goes by, um, you see how the, the cold water pool is set up and, you know, based on what you thought it would look like. Um, and you take a look at where you are with your gate changes and how, which are maybe your forecast over the next two, three months is going to look like temperature wise. And then I think then you've got enough information to say that base flow to kind of work up or down around should go up or down. And I think that's the checkpoint. It's going to be really hard to do that on a weekly basis because that'll be 
very influenced by short-term temperature events, either below average or above average. So you need to at least probably get a month into it to say, okay, now we've got a, we could actually start fiddling with that set point because you've got enough data to be able to see if I'm better off or worse off than we thought we might be at that particular juncture. Um, so it's probably not going to be instantaneous in that regard. Most of the work of uh, the folks who are going to be looking at this on a daily basis will be, do we need to make some adjustments, you know, very subtle adjustments about the gates and some of the blending in anticipation of what you see the next two or three days. Something you do with Shasta probably takes a couple of days to work through the reservoir and actually show up at the gauge location. So for an example, I look at this one gauge, the new gauge we put up, you know, just upstream of Highway 44. You look at the last four days and it looks pretty stable. And then just, but just overnight, you probably saw a good three quarters of a degree of the overnight temperatures there that are creeping up. So, you know, the question probably of this afternoon is, do we hop on that? What kind of a change can we make subtly within the configuration up at Shasta to work that through, knowing that you've got you know, probably 110 degree weather for the next couple of days? So where does this 0.5 uh, buffer come in? Because I hear us managing to a number and not to exceed another number, but where is the 0.5 buffer? So the red line on this graph is uh, water temperatures at Clear Creek, the temperature compliance point, and the line just below it is the new gauge at Bella Vista, which we've been calling the Highway 44 bit bridge. And that's where, um, right now anyway, the downstream most spawning is. So that buffer that we've been calling it is that we're managing to Clear Creek, but with the understanding that when run reds are really right now to the second line below. And I don't want to leave out the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for your perspective. That's quite all right. Um, my name is Larry Rabin. I'm the acting field supervisor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Bay Delta office. Um, but since the focus today is on upstream temperature management issues and in the interest of time, I didn't prepare any remarks for you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, I'm mindful of the time and I want to look to this side of the table. One, uh, uh, thank you for, are there more slides you just went through? I, okay, I just want to make sure. I mean, again, I, I always, I, sorry, it comes from my grandfather, what a regular person would think. Um, so in working through this plan that's in front of us, which we'll keep hearing more about as the, as the uh, day goes on, you all have described what you've tried to do to deal with an impossible situation. It's not a flush situation for fish. You're battling on the brink of extinction here, which I know is not comfortable for any of you being from a fish uh, agency perspective. It's not comfortable for us, and we're in a balancing Role. Our role is somewhat easier than yours is in a way because it's it's about that. How do you feel about the plan you've proposed? Do you feel like there's a shot at the fish surviving this year? Again, knowing you can't predict the future temperature beyond a week. Well, Carl Wilcox, I think, you know, we have a shot. We have done the best that due diligence that we can with the tools and capabilities that we have. I think we'll, uh, you know, there are no guarantees here as we saw last year, but I think we have a, an approach with some buffers in it uh, that can allow us to get there on the fishery side. But with lower survival. Correct. That it, I think I, didn't well, you say. Well, we're not it dealing from... with optimal survival conditions. We're well. No, I don't expect optimal. <laughs> but we're we're hoping. We're expecting lower. We're than targeting last year, right? better than last year. Oh, we are. Okay. That's, you know, I think from the, from the raft modeling, you can see that, you know, we're really looking to carry conditions, nominally. Good or tolerable conditions out into October where we totally lost that in September last year. 
and you know with the intention of improving survival and you know all of our efforts have been focused on that but that was a little unclear i thought i heard 15 percent, and then i heard i'm not sh- not sure so do you have um we're, have we're you run average, a model on average this? is 26 percent right. over well, the survival average survival to the red bluff collection station of juvenile survival has been about 26 percent and in some years much higher and some years much lower so as would be expressed by an average uh you know and last year it was five percent but in a year like this do you have averages for not like this (laughs) in critically dry years I mean, you're targeting something, I would imagine. So it's, if it's well, going to be less than 26, to target what are you targeting? A specific number. We're trying to, imp- you know, create conditions that will improve what we saw over what we saw last year. And last year was 5%. And I think, you know, given the fact that we're, if we're able to keep temperatures from going up into the 60s, uh, we may see better conditions and not have, you know, not have that happen for extended periods in late in the fall or late in the summer and then into the fall. I don't know if Garwin wants to render an opinion, but, you know, that's what we're trying to do. I wanted to ask for a point of clarification, if I may. Right, but can I have oh, sure. Mr. Yip answer the question? Oh, sorry. I'm just looking for layman's terms, how you feel about, I guess it's not your feeling, but what, what the plan is directed towards. I know it's not final. Sorry. Layman terms. Fool me twice, shame on me. Um, I don't know if we were fooled last year. We were certainly surprised about how temperatures went up so fast um, and the resulting mortality. Um, all the way up my management, we're not going to repeat 2014. At a minimum, we know what happened. Uh, we're trying to figure out how it happened. So we have the Heincast report that that uh, gives us indications of that and we're doing uh, we're doing everything we can to do things like delay uh, full side gate access uh, we're doing things like increasing what we think is tolerable in quotes tolerable temperatures where we have some predation or not predation um, some egg mortality but at least spread across throughout the season as opposed to what I think was the five percent survival is really the beginning part of last year's run um, we talk about habitat and genetic diversity, so spreading it out and having mortality throughout the season would be better than having mortality, you know, during one half or even more than a half of the season and targeting a certain part of the run. Um, likelihood of success, I think we landed in a pretty good spot. We have a base plan. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're not shooting high and then going down. We're not shooting low and going up. I think it's a plan that we, we, the fish agencies, can live with. The biggest benefit of this plan, I think, is the real-time operations. I hate to say it because that means you know four hours a day doing it. Um, but getting the real-time information on the location, duration, timing, quantity, and quality of fish, eggs, water supply operations, releases, all that stuff um, as close to real time as we can. In fact, this graph um, I received at 8.30 this morning and it shows up here. Anything to add? I'd agree with everything Carl and Carwin said, yeah. Sorry, Tim, I just... I just wanted to uh, get a, a point of clarification on the record. Much has been made today and over the past two years of the board's responsibility to balance various needs. Um, now you've said that this new proposed plan is acceptable to the fish agencies. And I guess my question is, to what extent in making that statement have the fishery agencies been engaged in that kind of a balancing uh, approach, because obviously this is not an optimal plan for fisheries, and yet by saying that you considered operations, that this is a plan you can live with given, you know, various issues, how much of that balancing that is the board's authority has been incorporated into the discussions and this determination by the fishery agencies? 
Well, I'd suggest it's been a, you know, a key consideration, particularly from the perspective of the operators and or input from the uh, water users who have had an opportunity to express their interests and have worked with this. And the original plan was a, a great example of everybody working together to come up with something. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Uh, I think the other thing to keep in mind, and John Lehi spoke to it in his presentation, is that you know what we do on Shasta then reverberates throughout the system, and not just from a water supply perspective, but from a an environmental perspective relative to what's going to happen to the uh, the fishery resources or the habitat resources uh, in other places. And so consequently, you know, we've been working to come up with a plan that balances the ability to maintain some level of suitable conditions in the delta and meet the delta, the minimal delta outflow criteria that, you know, we're going to be asking or the operating agencies are going to be asking for a, a relaxation of in July, which is supposedly what was in the plan for a critical year. And we're going to relax that farther. Uh, and I think we've seen the consequences on the species that rely on the Delta uh, in that they're at their lowest levels ever. And so we're trying to balance that. I think they're certainly from the, the water user perspective and fulsome. Uh, they're concerned about that. We're concerned about it because it means really bad things for salmon and steelhead this fall. And, you know, we recently, you know, as of yesterday, you know, made some decisions with on a real time basis about outflow in an effort to conserve water and not make releases from Folsom and Oroville that were planned to meet the June outflow standard. So I think we're constantly trying to do the best job of balancing. We also have share the same kinds of interests that the south of Delta people do, water users do, in that you know, we would like to meet refuge water supply. But if you know, if they're not getting some amount of water that can keep their canals wetted, then when the water for the refuges comes, it's going to get absorbed into the canals, and we're going to have release, release deliveries there. So it's a constant balancing effort uh, from all aspects, and particularly amongst uh, biological resources. If I, if I may just add a point, because uh, it might not be clear, some of the uh, initial assessments that were conducted and looking at, well, here we are, what, what do we do? Some of the alternative model runs that were looked at, we're looking at releases from Shasta of 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 CFS. Again, comparing it to what was in the original plan of 8,500, 9,000 CFS. So those were all reductions. But that lower one, 6,000, would have even greater, upwards of half a million acre foot water supply effect. And though it gets very complicated very fast, it didn't, though it had some other beneficial things in terms of temperature control, but not enough really to warrant in terms of coming together on a plan. So that's some of that balancing that went into even what's, you know, in the key elements of what's, uh, what we're talking about today. Yeah, thank you. I, and, and thank you for your response to that, Carl. I mean, I, I just wanted to emphasize the point here that, that what's being proposed already has measures of balancing in it. So for those who I'm sure who will come up and, and ask the board to move one way or another, recognize that this is not an optimal proposal for fisheries. It's not an optimal proposal for project operations and deliveries. There's already a certain amount of balancing that already went into it. My question was actually going to be about uh, the refuge uh, issue that you brought up. So thank you for going through methodically all of the things that uh, the fish agencies have to look at. Thank you. Uh, Ron, you have more slides, don't you? No, no, that's what we need to understand this. It's really hard. We need to feel your pain.
Yeah, maybe. And then when we're we're done with this, we'll move to the uh, American River water user pen. It, th this will probably um, some piece of this will kind of dovetail with what we've already heard. Uh, th this this graphic just shows the three key gauge locations that kind of covered this area. Carl kind of uh, showed this before this CCR gauge, which is in CDEC, uh, uh, for reporting. That's this Bonneview um, um, Avenue or? The, the, yeah, uh, the bridge there. This uh, SAC gauge location is the brand new one that Reclamation's installed and is, you know, rather than try, it's probably the closest to where the reds are forming right now based on the red surveys and the uh, carcass uh, counts. Uh, but as Carl said, it's brand new. So although it's calibrated uh, to a degree, it's a pretty new gauge. So that's why we uh, made a modification to kind of work with the CCR gauge. And that's certainly something that's kind of in the modeling tool already. Um, but we are actively looking at the data from this on an hourly basis, as well as the CCR gauge and actually the flows coming out of Keswick temperature-wise as we think about where we're at. This also kind of shows the relative point position. You can kind of see the little white blip where Shasta Dam is. So the travel, both in terms of potential heating and travel time from Shasta to make a change down to Keswick release is, uh, is a consideration when you're thinking about, let's say, two days ahead in terms of temperatures. You need to kind of factor that in because if you're going to make some kind of modification to try to cool some water or maybe back off a little bit because you've got too cold, you've got to kind of think it's not going to be instantaneous down at these these spots. So. Can I ask a question? Just again, the regular sure. person question. So if let's say you knew you have this, I've never heard the phrase heat storm. It's like a heat NATO or something. A heat storm happening the next, you know, of course, of course that's going to happen now as everything is happening at the same time, which is just awful. Um, would you, let's say you knew you'd had two days that were going to be hotter than normal. Would you ease off then on putting water out because you know it'll heat up during that period and then conserve the colder water to send out after? Or would you calibrate it to try and maintain that temperature consistently? I know if you're talking yeah. about a week, it's one thing, but in yeah, a two-day no. increment. Uh, typically, 